People who smoke at a young age have a much higher incidence of psychosis and psychotic disorders. I am a former community college history teacher who did time in a federal Christian Zionist drug gulag. Um, we think that there's a gene that predisposes people to schizophrenia, for example. People here work for the military industrial complex that kill people all around the world. And when people are exposed to marijuana, they have an onset of their illness about three years before we normally would see it. And their psychosis is much worse. The entire drug war is a fraud. The reason why marijuana and other drugs are kept illegal right. is because if they were legalized, the Pentagon, the CIA, and the White House would miss the money. Now, forgive me my crazy the old pothead speak is a little rusty, but allow me to try and translate for a second. Radical rant. All right, so if you enjoyed the uh, marijuana, the truth video from Steven Crowder, I'm just here to tell you that Steven Crowder is a reefer mad idiot. Uh, let's get right to all of his points. In fact, I'll even address some of the points that weren't originally addressed by the conservative. Uh, let me just remind you, I'll run them down real quick again. They're on the board if you can uh, see them on the webcam. One, marijuana is more harmful than alcohol, not less. Two, legalizing pot increases use. It does not decrease it. Three, there is almost no one in prison for convictions for marijuana use alone. Four, marijuana makes you much more likely to suffer from psychosis. And five, the biggest reason for the increase in use among young people is the propaganda that it's harmless. So uh, I think uh, we're all ready. Are you all ready to rumble? Let's get to it. All right. Is alcohol more dangerous than marijuana? Well... Let's take a look at all the people who've ever died from marijuana overdoses. Oh, right. <laughs> Zero. Because it's non-toxic. Whereas some college kid overdoses and dies on alcohol almost every weekend. Maybe we should compare all the public vomiting, domestic violence, and auto fatalities from marijuana as compared to alcohol to determine how harmful it is. Now, yes, marijuana is fat-soluble. Yes, the brain is mostly fat. But from there, all facts and reason and science go completely out the window. The reason the liver processes alcohol is because its job is to remove poisons from the body. <laughs> Doesn't it say something about drugs that our bodies fight to reject them as quickly as possible and all their metabolites within about three days, but our bodies hold on to those cannabinoids as long as they possibly can? And by the way, our bodies do not have an endoethanol system, but we do have an endocannabinoid system, which is what cannabis triggers for the high that we're experiencing. Point number two, as far as, uh, you know, what was the point two? Uh, legalizing pot increases use. Numerous studies have shown that the illegality or legality of marijuana has little effect on its use. As his video shows, plenty of teenagers are getting a hold of it, despite it being illegal in Michigan for all but medical use. Yeah, sure, Ann Arbor is decriminalized, but I can find you the same set of pot-smoking teens in Enid, Oklahoma, if I want to. But suppose legalizing marijuana does increase use. So? Perhaps that's a bunch of people who choose pot over OxyContin, and their health improves as they see fewer side effects. Maybe it's a bunch of college kids who trade keg stands for gravity bongs. Nobody ever seems to worry about increased alcohol use because I never hear any campaigns to ban humorous Super Bowl beer ads. Are there more teens smoking marijuana in medical and decrim states? Yeah, there are. But there were already more teens smoking before they became medical or decrim states. It's not the law changes that make people smoke pot. It's that where people are smoking pot, they change the law. His point number three was uh, no one in prison for marijuana use alone. Always love this one. The stats on people in prison for marijuana. Now, first of all, kind of sucks for that 0 0.1 to 1.4%, doesn't it? What, we have to imprison a token number of first-time nonviolent marijuana offenders in order to scare the rest? They're the sacrificial lambs? Is that the theory behind that? But really, this little one percentish figure they keep citing is bullshit. <laughs> Remember, they're citing... Marijuana-only offenses. Well, guess what happens if you're busted with a pound of weed and you happen to have a lawfully purchased shotgun? Ah, there is a gun charge. Now you're no longer a marijuana-only prisoner, are you? How about if you have a kid in the house? Hmm, felony child endangerment. Now you're no longer a marijuana-only prisoner. Oh, and did you and a bunch of friends chip in together to buy that pound? Aha, felony conspiracy. You're no longer a marijuana-only prisoner. 
And don't forget all the probationers, parolees, and third strikers who get busted for even as little as a joint or a failed drug test who then get sent back to prison for the original crimes that don't register as marijuana only. Plus, this figure does not include the people who end up in county and city jails, many of them there because they can't afford bail, Others sentenced there by local statutes that are more severe than the state statute. This comes into effect particularly for my friends listening in Colorado. For the people who say, well, you know, Amendment 64 is awful and Colorado already had decrim. Yes, you're right. It did. Colorado had decrim up to two ounces where you would only get a summons to appear in court. And then if you didn't appear in court, there would be a bench warrant sent out for you and you get 15 days in jail. It also doesn't consider that certain cities in Colorado, like Lakewood, had more stringent municipal penalties for for holding on to marijuana than the state did. And they could lock you up in the city jail for possession of marijuana. I digress. Number four, uh, marijuana makes you much more likely to suffer from psychosis. And, you know, bravo for finding the uh, schizophrenic old guy to, uh, you know, make your case there. That, you know, a lot of integrity there. Uh, let me just give you the facts. A 60-year study of mental illness in the United Kingdom found no rise in the rates of psychosis or schizophrenia, even as the popularity of cannabis grew during the hippie era. And another meta-analysis of mental hospitals in England, Wales, and Ireland found no variation in schizophrenic rates or admissions from 1996 to 2006, even as the dreaded skunk was becoming so popular. The fact is, about 1% of the population is schizophrenic. Now, indeed, if they smoke weed, it can exacerbate and hasten the onset of their psychosis. But schizophrenia is a complex disorder. It's mostly rooted in genetics and somewhat in environment. Now, certainly, if cannabis brought on psychosis in mentally healthy people, we should have seen a massive rise in schizophrenia in America, correlating with 1979, when 60% of high school seniors admit to having tried pot. And we didn't see it. And the number five point, the biggest reason for the increase in use among young people is the propaganda that's harmless. This is, this is where these right wing conservatives who might be cool with legalizing, uh, you know, for constitutional reasons so they can get their states' rights back, you know, to be able to ban gay marriage and do other things that they want their states to do. Uh, this is where they, uh, are against us on, you know, what might be called the left in drug policy and, and so forth, where we're, we're the evil Socrates, man. We're, we're poisoning the minds of the children. Let me get to that point. Increased use by young people, no doubt, is reflective of propaganda, but not from our side. That little nice chart you have about the perception of risk versus the youth use does indeed show that the riskier kids think pot smoking is, the less they'll do it. In the late 1970s, pot was thought of as harmless and more kids did it than has ever been measured. Then you see an increase in the risk perception beginning in 1980 when Ronald and Nancy Reagan and the whole Just Say No campaign started. This is your brain on drugs. You know, all those commercials, all the over the top lies about the risks of marijuana combined with the increase in drug testing did indeed scare teenagers into not using marijuana. I was there in the 1980s as a teenager. But then came Bill Clinton. Notice in that chart how the risk perception plummets in Clinton's first term. How do you tell kids smoking pot will lead them nowhere when a pot smoker is president? And then came the medical marijuana movement in Northern California in the mid-1990s, and then came the Google. It's not so much that drug legalizers came up with awesome propaganda about marijuana that turned the kids on. It's that drug legalizers have been telling the truth about marijuana, but only with the advent of the Internet did we have the means of countering the million-dollar ad buys from the government. And then kids who had been told, quote, I now have evidence that smoking one marijuana cigarette is equal in brain damage to being on Bikini Island during an A-bomb blast. End quote. President Ronald Reagan, 1981. Those kids who'd heard that crap could now look the facts up and look up the science on cannabis, on the Internet. And still, even as 18 states have medicalized, 15 states have decrimmed, and two states have legalized, and my God, I love saying that, past use still hovers between 30 and 40%, and perception of risk still hovers between 20 and 30%. 
Maybe we've reached the equilibrium where kids understand the actual risks of cannabis use. And if you want those kids to understand the actual risks of cannabis use on developing adolescent brains, which there are, you can't gain their trust with commercials of eggs in frying pans. Now, there's a few other points in this video I want to debunk here, and I'll take some of these into hour two as well, but here's a couple bonuses. Number six, uh, Crowder notes that people buy weed at dispensaries and sell it to kids. He posits that the cartels won't go away because people who make their living through crime will find another crime with which to make their living. Okay, so then we should give the marijuana market to criminals? No matter what we do, some kids are going to get their hands on weed just like beer. But when a kid gets a hold of some beer, no violent murdering criminal organization profits. Now, maybe a homeless guy earns 20 bucks buying a 12-pack for some teenagers, and the money that got spent at the store at least provided some jobs and some tax revenue for the state, which then can use some of it for alcoholism treatment for some kid who got started drinking too young. With marijuana, the kid doesn't even have to find the homeless guy. He just goes and finds another kid at the school who's the school weed dealer. And did you ever notice you never see any school beer dealers? Another point that he makes here, uh, when cauliflower ear guy shows up, you know, the former cop, warns us that it's a myth that no one's ever died from a THC-involved accident. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you didn't get that ear fighting straw men like this one. We have never said that nobody dies from marijuana-related accidents. We say nobody dies from marijuana, as in acute toxic overdose. Of course people can die in pot-related wrecks. So why aren't we calling for a return to alcohol prohibition? And why aren't we banning in-car dash computer systems and stereo systems? I mean, there's all sorts of irresponsible behaviors people engage in while they're driving that cause wrecks. But... Marijuana prohibition did not stop those wrecks, and it may contribute to them by failing to provide users a social construct for responsible marijuana use. Just look at the stats for drunk driving, which have dropped greatly since the advent of Mothers Against Drunk Driving in the 1980s, an increase in the drinking age in, to age 21, and a decrease in blood alcohol limits to .08, plus a strong educational campaign on drunk driving and better trained police officers and more drunk driving patrols. But there is no friends don't let friends drive stoned commercial on TV. Furthermore, I received a, a report from Paul Armentano, his latest uh, research and uh, PowerPoint presentation that he's doing on cannabis and driving. Very interesting statistic comes from uh, one of the studies that's on there. This is a, uh, now pull this up on my Twitter because I put it out just a little bit earlier. This was a study from 2005 called the Lawman study, and it found that the fatal crash risk for marijuana drivers at greater than 5 nanograms per milliliter is 2.12 times greater than a sober driver. But alcohol, people between 0.05 and 0.08, in other words, legal to drive, 6.29 times greater than a sober driver. Or another way to look at this, while a stoned driver or a driver with high tolerance might be twice the risk for a fatal crash at 5 nanograms, He's one-third the risk for a crash than someone who's a legal drinking driver. Think about that. We'll talk a little bit more about this Crowder video. We've got a couple other points to make on this. Plus, I'd love to hear your comments and questions on this. Whether you think it's satire or the real thing, uh, do you know people that think this way? I sure do. We'll take your calls at 971-533-7111 right here at Toker Talk Radio. And I've also invited Stephen Crowder on the show. I sent him a tweet and a comment. You're welcome to call in, Stephen. If, uh, let us know, is this satire, really, or do you really believe this stuff? And uh, by the way, I'm a little tougher to uh, debate than a crazy old man with schizophrenia or some teenager in Ann Arbor. So you've been warned. That's all the time we've got for Hour 1. Thanks for joining us. For everyone here helping to produce the Russ Belleville Show, and big thanks to our big donors. Uh, I'll tell you more about that on tomorrow's show. Brave Michaela's on tomorrow's show as well. Make sure you tune in. For Brian the Red, I'm Radical Russ. And until next time, take care of each other, tokers. This is the Russ Belleville Show. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. Take a seat, you're